Hello, I'm Chris, and this is Having a Mosey Through Dragon Quest 1, or, as the game is known in Japan, Dragon Questo, a title which is proudly displayed above its iconic English logo in a striking black on yellow font. Releasing in Japan on the 27th of May 1986 for the Famicom, and over three years later in the USA as Dragon Warrior for the Nintendo Entertainment System, Enix bestowed upon the world a game that defined and trailblazed its own genre, the Japanese role-playing game, or JRPG for short. Now, I love JRPGs and I love this game. Let me tell you why. Dragon Quest is a game that is elegant in its execution, stylish in its simplicity and whimsical in its world building. It is the blueprint that spawned a thousand games. In the way that Bethesda Head and Skyrim Daddy Todd Howard would say, it just works. Dragon Quest is from a time when there wasn't a plethora of mandatory tutorials. Tutorials in which the developer practically leers over your shoulder, whispering sweet nothings in your ear such as, you need to press A to jump dude. We aren't going to let you pass this tutorial until you press A to jump dude. If you pay us a small fee of $3.99, we'll press A to jump for you, dude. Dragon Quest is a video game in which you leave the starting castle and immediately see the final dungeon, the Dragon Lord's Domain. This is tantalizingly close, but quite unreachable, due to the narrow sliver of river that separates the two locations. You, the hero, must take the long way around, traversing the world, gaining levels and equipment to eventually vanquish the big bad Dragon Lord. Being the first entry in its series, the plot of Dragon Quest I is very straightforward. Set within the lands of the medieval Aleph Guard, the plot can be summarised as rescue the princess and slay the Dragon Lord. The Wikipedia synopsis for this game amused me. Listen to this. Dragon Warrior's plot is a twist on the classic damsel in distress, in that the player does not even have to meet or speak with her to complete the game. And yeah, that's true, really. Despite being presented as the main driving force of your adventure, saving the princess is optional. If you head straight for the exit, upon arriving in the dungeon where she is kept, you will miss her completely. Of course, you probably have no chance of killing the fearsome green dragon that guards her upon your first encounter, but the implication very much is that you're supposed to, you know, go back and have another go at it. I'll be perfectly honest, in my first encounter with this dragon during my most recent playthrough, he hurt my feelings. People always talk about Dragon Quest V as being unique for giving the player a choice of two or three prospective wives with whom to settle down. However, no one talks about the revolutionary approach Dragon Quest undertakes, in which it dares to give the player a choice between rescuing and acquiring a love interest, or simply embracing the bachelor life and leaving her to rot in the dungeon. But that wouldn't really be in the spirit of the role-playing game, would it? In which you, the player of the game, undertake the solemn role of the hero. Never mind player choice. In 1986, Dragon Quest was out there pioneering the concept of player apathy. Lord Alfred Tennyson once wrote that it's better to have loved and lost than never to have loved at all. Now, I'm no historian, but I'm fairly sure that 19th century English poet Lord Alfred Tennyson did not play 20th century Japanese cultural sensation Dragon Quest, else I'm sure he would have led with that quote on his own personal GameFAQ guide for the game. Dereliction of princess rescuing duty aside, Dragon Quest presents a very simplistic plot. There are no complex political quagmires to be found here, no four mystical crystals worshipped by four appropriately themed groups of hippies. No interpersonal relationships, drama or conflict. Don't get me wrong, I appreciate these things too, but sometimes it's refreshing to just go back to basics. Just let me sit back and brutally mow down adorable cartoon monsters in a story that could be summed up very quickly in an elevator pitch.
Series architect Yuji Hori was inspired by several Western games at the time of creating the original Dragon Quest, namely titles like Ultima. As an example, Ultima 4 was released just under a year before Dragon Quest, and I do believe it's quite easy to see the influences right there. By creating Dragon Quest, Yuji Hori basically brought the RPG genre in Japan to the mainstream, and now here we all are, all these years later, clamouring for the next big JRPG. Where 1986's Dragon Quest shines is not in its prose, but in its gameplay. This is where the elegance comes in, its logical and mathematical systems weaved in harmoniously to provide a perfect difficulty curve as you go from fighting the cutest slime to the fiercest dragon. All of this happens within a very tight but fair set of rigid mathematical calculations and game mechanics. Take your common slime. They just hang around Tentacle Castle, minding their own business, until the hero comes along and strikes down their three health points for a measly two gold and one XP. This is done via a robust and revolutionary for the time turn-based combat system. As you traverse the land of Alefgard, the enemies will get slightly stronger as you go, dropping incrementally more loot and XP. Now this may seem like a fairly arbitrary description of the difficulty curve, but please remember this game released at a time where the concept of health points in video games was simply, this Goomba is alive, oh, Mario just trod on him, it's dead now. What I'm saying is, the finesse of calculating what the individual stats and loot of each creature should be to ensure a balanced, rewarding and fun experience would have been quite the feat for 1986. This basic formula is so rigid and so effective that it's literally the scaffolding upon which every subsequent Dragon Quest game and many others are built. This idea of playing a character, exploring a world ever increasing in difficulty with only your cold, hard mathematical stats and gear to protect you was perfected right here. Dragon Quest pioneered and basically mastered the turn-based battle system about 40 years ago. It is a system that is robust, user-friendly and very intuitive. It's also very accessible. As a civilization enthusiast, I've always enjoyed having the extra time to think about my decisions, to plan my move several turns in advance, instead of just button mashing or spam clicking and hoping for the best. By the way, every fight in Dragon Quest is a one versus one. There ain't no party systems here, buddy. On the bright side, this means that monsters don't get to bring their friends along either. What sets Dragon Quest apart from some of the more contemporary offerings in the genre is just how free and open the world is. Granted, I, I say free, I mean free, with a big old asterisk. Yes, you can leave Tantagel Castle at the start of the game and mosey on over to the east towards Cole or south towards Cantlin, but the game will very quickly give you an education about where you currently are and aren't equipped to go in the form of a monstrous beatdown. In this regard, Dragon Quest is rather difficult. The only way you'll find out whether you're able to survive more than one or two encounters in a new area of Alefgard is by wandering over there and dying by the third encounter. The game offers one hint, in the form of wooden bridges. Once you cross a wooden bridge, taking you further away from the starting city of Tantagel, you can usually assume that enemies are going to be just a little bit more difficult from now on. The hardest part of the game, by far, is the long walk to the fortress town of Cantlin, if you ask me. It's entirely out of the way, and you must cross over several of these wooden bridges, these harbingers of doom, in order to get there. I just want to give a special shout out to the family of Chimeras. I'll be honest, they hurt my feelings. The dungeons themselves are no joke. There are several in the game, all functioning as these dark, twisted labyrinths which get progressively harder and harder to navigate, using torches or even with glow, the best spell in the game. I'm not gonna say exactly how I managed to find my way through these catacombs so quickly, but let's just say that as I looked over my shoulder, there was a single set of footprints in the sand. Where, you know, game facts carried me. Returning to the Dragonlord's castle, getting in there is quite straightforward. There are several artifacts that you'll need to acquire, namely the Sunstone and the Staff of Rain. 
before bringing them to the local sage who hangs around down south. He'll present you with a way of creating a magical rainbow bridge which does admittedly look a little bit like every other wooden bridge in the game. The Dragon Lord's Palace is a fitting final dungeon. It's very atmospheric, the monsters are tough, and you'll have to stumble through several basement floors, hopefully picking up the legendary sword along the way before finally reaching the big bad himself. He'll offer you a choice. Join him and rule half of Aleph Guard alongside him, or fight to the death. Did you know that you can now canonically choose the evil ending? Simply select yes, and then throw your Nintendo Switch out the window because you don't deserve nice things. Then load up Dragon Quest Builders, which picks up on the events of the original game should the hero have hypothetically chosen the Dragon Lord's ending. You may have to sheepishly go outside and retrieve your Nintendo Switch for that, or just get the game on PlayStation 4 or PC. By the way, the Dragon Quest Builders games are really good. I'll be talking about them a lot in future. Of course, what you'll actually do is select no, because you're a good, decent human being. And so the tricky final battle will begin. Upon my own first encounter with the fearsome Dragon Lord, I reached his second form whilst barely breaking a sweat. Then I fought his second form. He hurt my fear and deterred. I picked up my endgame gear, my packed lunch, and my dignity once more, trudging back over to his castle for the umpteenth time, with the intention of having a word with him. Honestly, it was really good. I think we hashed it out, covered a lot of ground, and even reached a breakthrough or two. Anyway, he's dead now. Upon completing the game, the king offers the player his kingdom and rulership. In a power move that is, to my knowledge, completely unmatched by any of the following Dragon Quest protagonists, the player refuses, instead peacing out, finding his own kingdom and taking the king's daughter with him. Though I will say that, at the end of Dragon Quest VIII, its own protagonist pulls a similarly slick manoeuvre. This ending hereby sets up the events of Dragon Quest II which I may or may not go into at some point over the course of this YouTube channel. The second name to pop up in the opening credits of the 2019 Nintendo Switch port of Dragon Quest is Akira Toriyama. Now, anyone with even a passing knowledge of any form of Japanese animation would be very quick to clear their throats, raise their hands and pipe up to say in unison, that's the Dragon Ball Z guy. And well, they'd be correct. The Dragon Quest monster design is iconic, and it all started here with Akira Toriyama's art direction. The monster designs are so good that they've literally been using the same designs whilst chucking a few more in here and there with every release for the last 38 years. From the adorable little slime all the way up to the Dragon Lord, each monster stands out in its uniqueness. Being the first of its series, the Bestiary in Dragon Quest is somewhat smaller than later entries as you can imagine, but what designs they have here are still fantastic, despite there being quite a few recolorings here and there, namely the Slime and She Slime, and all of those goddamn Chimeras. Admittedly, the Nintendo Switch port isn't the best example or version of Dragon Quest in which to talk about the game's aesthetic merit because honestly, it's a bit weird. The strange mishmash of the classic background art for the battles and the original tile design for the overworld contrasts harshly with the peculiar choice of sprite work that has been used to represent the player's avatar and other characters. An unfortunate carryover of being a mobile port to begin with. In our current world of Octopath Traveler, Final Fantasy Pixel Remasters and heck, even Dragon Quest XI's 2D mode which release on the same day as these remasters on the Switch, why didn't the game look like any of those? I mean, seriously, just, just look at his face. Look at all their faces. They look like the love children of a Lego figure and, and a Moomin. In conclusion, Dragon Quest was, and is, a revolutionary part of gaming history, and it certainly shouldn't be ignored. It can be cleared quite easily in a weekend if one puts their mind to it, and I would thoroughly recommend giving it a go. Thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you next time. Hello.
So that was my review of Dragon Quest 1. It was actually the first Having a Mosey what I wrote for my blog. I did so towards the start of last year, before I even had any intention of turning it into a YouTube series, so I hope that I've managed to translate it to the screen appropriately. I'm just going to overlay this with some footage from Dragon Quest VIII, because that was my first Dragon Quest. It's still one of my favourite games of all time, if not my actual favourite, so I will be going into this game in depth at some point in the future. I do apologise for how sort of abruptly this review ended. I just kind of wanted to put something out a little bit shorter, save waiting all the way to the end of the month for my next review. I have two more like this, so I have Outrun 2006 and Fable Anniversary, which are already pre-written, and I'll try and slot in between bigger reviews. And then once I've done that, I might just sort of keep it as like a wildcard slot to talk about games that I love, but that I haven't got 30 minutes worth of content to make out of. So we'll see how that goes in future. Anyway, I'll pop all my links in the description again as usual. Thank you very much for watching, and I will see you next time.